Hi, I'm John Siracus with the Digital Mastermind. You're listening to The Climb. This is where agency owners and leaders tune in to get growth tips and strategies for growing their businesses. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of The Climb. Today, we're going to be speaking with Jim Harrison about creativity, what your agency can do with creativity, as well as how you can take advantage of potentially some downtime that you and your agency might be experiencing right now. So Dave, when I say creativity, what comes to mind for you? Uh, You know, deep down, I want to say art. Um, I think that's why I got into web development was I loved art class, but I wanted to make money. So I pivoted that towards the web. And uh, that was always my most creative outlet. Art, huh? Yeah, I, I think of and uh, problem solving, because that's I think it's one of the if you can define the problem, it's a creative approach to to tackle it. And sure. I was listening to, uh, it's kind of he's a polarizing person these days. Jordan Peterson, right? Some people believe with his views and not. And sure. it was one of these things that came up in my feed, so I watched it, and it said, "Not everybody is creative," and I wholeheartedly disagree with that. Is that the guy that says the um, first thing you do when you wake up is make your bed? I uh, know. He's the guy that literally only eats meat now because it helps treat his psoriasis. It's hmm. yeah, he's he's super he's super brilliant in a lot of areas, um, super out there in others. But uh he said that yeah, not everybody is, you know, creative and I, I disagree with that. I think it's problem solving and if you can you know, and if you want to just go toward the, <laughs> right, there might be people that are, and I just saw uh, your face. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with him there because, uh, I mean, I get that you can tell me that problem solving is on a scale, but I mean, when you're so far on one side of the scale that your ability to, I mean, we talked about it last episode that if somebody comes to me and on their first attempt to solve a problem fails and gives up, I have no use for them. And, and those people develop habits and patterns. And those people just aren't problem solvers. And so also to circle back, I actually like that I said art because I've always said that there's an art to what we do and what we do is solve problems, you know, and there's an art to do that. And the people that can do it efficiently without going down a bunch of rabbit holes and wasting a bunch of time. I mean, there's an art to solving clients problems. No, I agree. And I I think in his point to it was and, and I'm adding a definition that he didn't have, right, about the, the, the problem-solving standpoint. And I believe his was more on the, if you wanted to be a musician or you wanted to make money at it and, you know, so on sure. and so forth. You know, very, very dad-like conversation, I believe, for a lot of people. Right. But I'm with you where I th- and I, but, but I also, I'm going to sound a little fuzzy here. I think art is in everything. If you are a real craftsman, craftsperson in the way that you – handle your work or whatever it is that you do, you can, you know, f- find art in anything in problem solving, um, you know, whether it's math or if it's, you know, writing a song, there's, there's something when you can define and distinctly, you know, say like, this is, this is what we want to, you know, overcome. This is our obstacle. Beautiful things happen. And I think that's where uh, creativity lives. You know, one of the more interesting problems that people have to solve that sets the tone for the rest of your life is, high school what, what are you going to do after it's it's the profession that you pick after you know around that time like what major do you go after so many people can't answer that and come out of college with no direction still and they kind of flounder and there's so many though that come out with no plan and they do great and they flourish well, i would say there's some i mean it's not the rule it's the exception yeah Yeah. And yeah, I I think it's one of those things now it's where, because Steve jobs didn't go or dropped out of college. I don't even think he really went. I think he went to like a class. All these other people, they don't like, Oh, well college is, yeah, we, you know, we don't need to, we don't need to go to college because these, you know, billionaires didn't go. Everyone that lately, it seems like employees, my wife, anyone that I get in a debate with, they're like, Oh, there's most people are doing X and I'm like, no, that's no, there's a very small amount. And yes, there are some people that are doing that, but that is the minority, not the majority. Right. Yeah. But there is a a strong debate 
I'm kind of getting in a tangent here. Oh, that college is gone in the next generation. We, we are not going to traditional college. After Generation Z, it's gone. I, well, I, th- I think there's still going to be an education platform that is going to be like college, but the cost is substantially have to going, uh, going to drop, especially because all these people being able to just work remote. How are you going to justify the cost to, for, for anything else? You know? Especially when all the knowledge that they could possibly even provide you is freely accessible. Lives on the internet. Yep. There's, you know, really what we need to be teaching in high school is really smart, creative problem solving skills on how to access that data. Which I think is a great segue into our guest because that's what he works at a university and he's developed, I believe a curriculum and he'll probably get into a little bit more where he teaches, he he teaches creativity, which I think is a fantastic thing because I know it's like a muscle in a lot of respects where I've seen, you know, people uh, that were like amazing painters at one point in their life, you know, they did all this and it's like, Oh, why don't you just say, ah, no, just, just don't, just don't do that anymore. You know, it's just like, what? There's like this whole other life that you had, but I believe there's all this shit that we just pull into our lives that will kill that piece of us. You know, that, that part that's, you know, brave and willing to dare to create things that people might say, Hey, that sucks. Right. It does. But you can also look on the other end of it is that if you can get your shit together, figure out your game plan by the time you're 40, you can actually, or, you know, I, I, that's just arbitrary. By the time you get older and you got your shit handled, you can actually go after passions in a, in a much different way than when you were 25 struggling. Like I, I, I see older people all the time going after their passions today. And I think it's amazing. I'm like, that's, that's great. Uh, so, you know, hopefully everybody gets that back. Yeah, that's one, that's one approach. But I think a lot of the others, they'll start with their passion and either A, burn out, or B, make some money uh, with right. it. It's, it's hard to make money with your passion unless your passion is highly valued by society. Like my passion is programming and problem solving. I am lucky. I feel lucky. You know, all I had to do is do what I like to do and people are going to pay me money for it. Yeah, I, I think I'm in the I'm, I'm in a category where like I've had multiple passions and passions burn hot and like, yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. You know, I, I used to love, you know, skateboarding. I used to love music. Those were passionate racing dirt bikes. Like all those things were passionate at one time. Like, nah, I don't want to do that anymore. So those are also very uh, uh, young. young things. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you can't do that forever. No. Yeah. And maybe there is some, some future on that. I love writing, right? I mean, that's you know, one of the th- ways that got me into to marketing and, you know, creativity there. That's something I still do, but at times I absolutely fucking hate it. Well, you got to be in the right mindset. I mean, if you're not in the, that's, what's got to be tough for, you know, every once in a while I can write a pretty damn good memo and I'm proud as hell of it. But if I'm not in the mood, it's terrible or it's forced or it's really difficult. And then I think, damn, what about if this is my full-time job? Like the, think about it as a copywriter and I don't, I'm not a copywriter, but if that was your job and you, you know, somebody cut you off on the highway or the subway, somebody spilled coffee on you, you're just having a shitty day and you got to come in and write the greatest copy every, I mean, you got to come in and perform. That's gotta be so difficult. It is. You still do it. You still come in. Yeah. And you're just like, okay. And you ship out something that sucks. I helped one of our team members the other day on something that I swore was the worst ever, but we had to get something over to, it was a print piece actually to a magazine grin. And they're like, oh, this is incredible. This is, this is amazing. This is exactly, you know, what we're looking for, them and the client. I was like, okay. It, it, but it was, a, it was a really tough day. I wasn't necessarily cut off coming into the office, not too much traffic, but just the other influxes were right. pressing in the moment where you could not get into the flow state or the zone. And, you know, your, your perspective from the customer's perspective, you know, slightly different. Yeah. And today, I don't think people get to take as much time as they used to. And this could just be a perspective because everything is so rushed and, and quick now where I believe back in the day, somebody might've been able to take a month with what we had to produce in a matter of hours. Yeah. I just, I don't know. I feel like that's revisionist history. I think people look back and think, Oh, I, I, yearn for the days where we could spend i mean developers say that i I heard feedback recently saying oh i wish we had time to do things right and i'm like what what does that mean working is right i mean but they were talking about the stylistic approach and and thinking about back in the day if you go back and watch the history of atari 
and and listen to the the stress and deadlines that those developers were on that was 40 years ago mm-hmm. they didn't have shit for time to 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 do, write this software i mean it, I, and, I, and you know what I th- what I look at is the distractions because the I accessibility is what I, I think I'm speaking to. Yeah, the time I was even thinking about that. If it was the 1950s or 1960s, the deadlines would have been crazy. You would have multiple projects coming in, so that still would have been pressing. But just it's it's not a Slack message, it's an email. If it's not an email, it's a text, it's a phone call, and all of these things are so important that need to be taken care of. So the whole Slackification. I have done, you know, I guess, thankfully I'm in management before Slack kind of took over our business because I mean, I know some people in our organization that have our clients in their Slack channels, just pinging them all day long. And I would, that would just drive me nuts, but uh, free tip of the day for listening to the climb. Uh, have you ever, did you know that there's a command called slash remind in Slack? Like, to get like like remind me in 20 minutes an hour yeah. or three hours yeah. yeah i did not know that and i like day one using. we should all be using that yeah you i know? do that all the time even you'll slack me something and i was like remind me in 20 minutes perfect yeah that's how it should be used and I, I i upon learning this uh went to our account managers and taught one of them that i was like you are missing things use this command they're like oh wow this is great so it's you almost- can also do unread too. So if you go in, you see something that's unread, you know, you could, depending on how you want to use it as uh, your management, you know, we should have a Slack expert on here. Ooh. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Just to tell us how dumb we are when it comes to using this. I this bet you tool. there is a ton of little hidden gems in Slack that, or, or not even just built in gems, but like super like great productivity plugins that you can add, even, you know, paid or free. Reminds me of when somebody grabs like a twenty dollar bill and they're like, "You want to see some really cool things you didn't know were on the bill?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> stuff like that just sucks me in. Hold it correctly, you know. <laughs> yeah, like you see the shooter right there behind the right. chair, that yes. old number. But uh, along those lines, I I think we need to go ahead and welcome our guest today before we get to, uh, too far down on the rabbit hole. Jim Harrison, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Oh, no, glad, glad you can make it. All right. So before we get into everything, I'd like to give listeners an overview of your climb. Uh, so you're a UF grad. You're an art director for 13 years upon graduating, developed a program at UF where you then became the director of uh, creative services. And then you're uh, we're the creative director and a, fac- a faculty lecturer from uh, 16 to 19. And along the way, you've been an owner and principal of your company, Metavisual, where you're a brand strategist, uh, a speaker, as well as a uh, essentially a creative consultant. Yeah, creative consultant, creative director. You know, I've, I've come a long way in almost 30 years, all the way through, you know, the traditional world of advertising and graphic design and art direction, um, through creative direction and into strategic communications, which was kind of my role at the university as, as the university's creative director starting in 2010, all the way through, like you said, a, a faculty position where I started to just, I, I basically crafted a, a, a course on the mechanisms and psychology of creativity, how our brains work when we're, when we're trying to come up with ideas as individuals and as in groups. So I've, I've had a great ride uh, learning how to just basically be ultimately a creative catalyst. You know, I mean, I was, I'm reading a book uh, right now called Riding the Creative Roller Coaster by a guy named Nick Udall. And he used that phrase and I thought, creative catalyst. Okay, I, I can go with that. that. That's a great summation because when you tell somebody you're a designer, that means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Right now, everyone's a creative director. So even calling yourself a creative director doesn't quite do you know, the role justice. But you know, what I do now is I help people unlock their creative potential. I work with clients, I teach, I workshop, you know, I do all these things to make sure that anyone can recognize and realize that the, the creative potential that rests on their side of the fence um, is as much uh, as what rests on my side of the fence as a, as a professional who's done it for almost three decades. So, and I really enjoy that work. I really enjoy kind of opening people up to, to what their own potential is for, for ideation and creativity and solving tough communications problems. Right on. No, I appreciate that. And uh, to, you know, to everybody has tools to support their climb. This is just to, this kind of gives me a profile of, you know, who you are. Yeah. Um, so are you, I, uh, are you, would you say you're PC or Mac? Oh, I'm definitely Mac. I started, I was the first graphic design student at the University of Florida to own 
my own Mac. It was a Mac 2. <laughs> it, was a, it was a Mac 2 CX, okay? And it had 40 megabytes of RAM in the hard drive. I mean, who Whoa, is- Whoa, big baller there. And I'll, and I'll tell you a quick story and I'll implicate myself. I think the statute of limitations has, has long since passed. The bookstore at the University of Florida had at the time, amidst all the art supplies, a special table in the middle of the bookstore where they would dim the lights around it and then put a spotlight down on the Mac 2s that just came out. These were $5,000 computers in 1991, right? Wow. And uh, instead of taking my savings account money and buying my first car, I bought my first computer. And at the time, I kid you not, this is a true story, three and a half inch floppy disks with 1.44 megabytes of storage. I could slip that in and move Photoshop 1.0 onto that entire, the app, the whole thing onto one disk, which I took home and basically opened up and said, how does this work? And right. And I, so I taught myself Illustrator 88, the first one. Wow. 88. Yeah. And Photoshop one in my apartment going, how's this going to work? How am I going to make my living using these tools? I got educated right at the cusp of knowing how to do everything by hand, building, you know, big paste up layout documents by hand for, for offset printing then transitioning to where everything is digital, right? And so I'm, I'm really thankful that that's, that was my coming of age. I kind of got a, a great two-sided approach to how to, how to, how to build. Was that your first experience with like a, with a Mac? That was my first Mac, yeah. I mean, What I, was yours, Dave? Because I know you're, you're a big fan of Mac. Uh, I still, still haven't used one yet. <laughs> <laughs> what, I did, what I did is I went my first job out of school I took a job in a design shop here in Gainesville called Deca Design, working with a great guy named Nick DeCarlos. And he was a PC shop and I was freaking out. It's like, oh man, I don't know if I can do this PC thing. You know, it took me all of like two weeks to figure out that the software was all the same. It was just a matter of knowing how the operating system was. Right. No big deal, right? And so I spent uh, 14, 15 years doing, you know, sophisticated graphic design and visual communication systems on you know dells and gate, gateway pcs you know it was it was no big deal right and then ultimately i kind of found my way you know back to some Macs when i got asked to um uh, come back to the university as a, as a creative director in 2010 so well, there was a period there like in the early 90s that like apple was about to fail wasn't there i mean there was that time where steve jobs wasn't there and they were yeah you know, right. they had to pull him back into it. So that, I mean, that almost coincides with the time you're working on Dell's is, you know, when Mac was just well, kind of. You know, it's funny. is like, if you, if you go back and look at some of the advertising and some of the history of, of what Mac did when Steve Jobs wasn't there, it's cringy. It's pretty cringe inducing. And you go, wow, they were way off the reservation. Right. They were about getting out of the computer business and they had all these different product lines and they had swag. They were manufacturing stuff that was just weird, you know? Um, I think a lot of companies, uh, not to get too far on tangent, have tried this thing where they think that they're a lifestyle brand. So Evernote, for instance, was one time selling like socks and like $30 moleskine notebooks. Right, like, right. who the hell do you guys think you are? You're, you're a note taking app, you know, and it right. sounds like, granted, I mean, that, that, that point of focus uh, it was also happening to Mac at that point. Right. I mean, some, sometimes brands will kind of drink a little bit too much of the Kool-Aid, I think, and say, let's step back and say, what kind of company are we really, right? Is Evernote a, 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 Evernote, they probably sat around one day and said, I think we're just an organizational brand and anything that helps people get organized can be a part of what Evernote, you know, does. And that's how you, that's how you end up selling moleskin notebooks and you stray too far and get too broad and too generalized, you know? Right. The but, Nike of note-taking. And, well, uh, hey, we should all aspire to be as tight, tight a brand as, as Nike, it's, it's, that's the kind of magic of, of knowing how to do and build a brand the right way is to, to scale it that big and have that much consistent focus on what your brand really stands for, but yet have it be so broad that it can be a lot of things to a lot of different people. That is a very, very small bullseye that very, very, very few companies ever get to hit. You know, I think, yeah. Apple finally found their way to it, you know, Nike, of course, and, and, and perhaps a few others. We'll see. So uh, I, I want to jump right to it. So sure. we talk about a ton of different things today, you know, you know, off time with coronavirus. But one, one of the things I see is a lot of agencies talk about being creative, mm-hmm. but they 
don't necessarily nurture it in any way, yeah. right? So, uh, what are what are some some methods that you know? Uh, first off, do you actually work with agencies? I should have yeah, clarified. Sure. That. I, I I can I I am an agency. I do work with my clients, but I also consult. And I also you know work with other agencies, some digital agencies as well. You know to 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 kind of go through these things. I realized, you know, as my career kind of went on that, um, you know, one of the things that really sort of opened me up and, and got kept me fired up, kept my fires burning, so to speak, was this idea of, of bringing others along in the journey and helping others, right? Rather than being the, um, the provider and uh, secret keeper of the arcane creative knowledge that could come in and for, you know, X number of dollars per hour provide you or your company or your agency with, with this kind of skill. I mean, don't get me wrong, I still do that kind of work, but I would much rather help you as an agency get more creative and that be how I helped you. Um, and how do you do that? How do I do that? Yeah. I do it by being sort of like radically open and honest about it. And I also don't hold any ego about the skill and the expertise that I have. I just give of it, right? And I realized that that was one of the things that I wanted to kind of disrupt, right? To agencies traditionally say, we have our secret proprietary process. We have our secret sauce. We have our secret employees that we- All bullshit, bullshit, we, bullshit. We treat very well so that they will keep creating the amazing creative work. Bean bags, ping pong tables, and video games. Right? Yeah, right. And one of the things I decided that I wanted to try to disrupt is to say, okay, client, let me teach you how to think like I think. You know, Why, why would I want to protect that? And, and what I really hope and what I really feel deeply about that is that it's an opportunity just to build a more significant relationship with a client, you know, when you're actually pulling the curtain back. You know, I used to get blowback all the time. I've worked with a lot of really, really good people. I've had a lot of great mentors in my career. And I've worked with some people that, yeah, maybe not so much. And one of the things I got pushed back once, I remember working with someone who, who I didn't always see eye to eye on, was helping a client see and visualize what we were thinking. And that often means get, putting some stuff on the table and pulling the curtain back a little bit and saying, what if we tried this or what if we tried that? And I remember after the fact, this person pulled me aside and said, don't, don't give away the ideas. Don't, don't, don't go tell them what the secrets are before we, and I said, but there's no way to get them to get excited. I'm happy to share. That's like them. in the sales process, right? Yeah. I'm happy yeah. to share with them and crack my brain open and say, here's how I see it. Here's how I think about it. Does that get you excited? And, and, and I really do enjoy that sort of open collaborative process. And so to answer your question, that's what I do. I go in and, and if I can share a technique that I've used before and I can share it with an agency so that they can use it. Let's say there's an agency, right? There's, uh, it's like a team of, you know, 10 or 20 or whatnot. And they, sure. they do t traditional digital marketing. So this is something that Dave and I, and we've spoke with other guests about where there's this, this shitty marketing playbook that everybody is just like, this is what we're going to do. And then they put the play, the, the marketing playbook in motion and it's just vanilla, like nothing, you know, really happens. You gotta, you know, take some risk. So if, if you, how can you inspire a team or, or nurture it to say like, okay, guys, like what does that look like, you know, in, in your experience? Well, the first thing I always point out is if you use a common approach, you will arrive at common solutions. Mm, I like right? that. You know, a, a, a standard is called a standard for a reason. And, and so even if it meets a standard, most of us are looking to exceed, right? Most of us are looking to go beyond, break new ground, go above and beyond, impress a client with something that no one had thought before. And the sort of the holy grail, the Shangri-La is, uh, you know, what Steve Jobs used to say, you know, you're just connecting dots that no one's seen before, right? And, and the, the idea that, wow, that's, a, that's, that's the light bulb. I've not seen it positioned that way or thought of that way before um, is, is what we're all headed towards, right? And you can't take a playbook and run the same play you've run 100 times and hope that the definition of insanity doesn't apply to that, right? You've got to be willing mm -hmm. to do certain things different and change certain perspectives to hope right? That you've got enough horsepower and enough raw material to create fresh thinking. Um, I usually talk about a, a series of, of habits. And this is another, another answer to your question. I'm happy to share this advice with anyone, including other agencies, even people that may someday bid against me for a project. I, I, I don't really care about that because, you know, those bids are bids and, you know, Life's because Jim short. always wins, be honest. No, 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 no. I mean, life is too short not to work with good people. If I can help someone, I'm more than happy to help. But here's what I do. I talk about the habits and behaviors that you can engage in as an individual and as a team and as an agency that um, don't have to apply specifically to a project that you're working on, but they're just good habits 
that position you for creative success later, you know, and there's some key, key, key things. And I want to hold a couple of them in reserve because I know that we're going to talk about some specifics about the, about um, COVID-19 later, but you know, this idea of um, the, the kind of things that you can do, like putting fresh experiences in your, in your path to, to add more raw material to your life. Um, um, there's something called signaling, which is, which is amazingly uh, um, overlooked. This idea that it's the reason why brainstorms usually fail, right? Is this idea that we don't take the time to tell people what we want from a meeting. And we say, okay, everyone, come on in. We're going to brainstorm. And you, you've been in, I'm sure you've been in a hundred of these meetings where, one of two things happens either the first idea sparks at minute 45 and you get 10 minutes of really interesting conversation and then someone says okay so we need to wrap this up we'll get the next one scheduled next week and we'll carry this forward and everyone kind of leaves the room and they're sort of side-eyeing each other and they're saying did we actually decide on anything you know did we right get anything done you know or second thing the second scenario we've all been in that first place a million times the second thing is that you know, ideas go back and forth. What do you think about this? And what if we did that? No, oh, that might work, but not so much. And you get a little bit of it. It becomes a little bit of a, 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 a West side story kind of back and forth, right? You've got the people in the room that are, that are tossing out ideas at a, at a rapid fire pace. And then you've got all the people on the other side of the table or the other side of the room that are saying, eh, you know, and they're, and they're nitpicking and they're, they're knocking this one down. And they're saying, oh, that, there may be something there, you know, what's happened in those scenarios is that the team hasn't said, Hey, guess what? Today, we're not judging anything we got to get to a hundred ideas in 60 minutes and that's a breakneck pace. So no bad ideas, no wrong answers. And we don't need to judge anything today, right? Strong, strong signaling by leaders, you know, of agencies is a great way to make sure that everyone knows exactly what we're after. When we're after ideas, we're going to get a bunch of ideas. We're not, we're not after judgment next week. We're not after new ideas. We're after judgment. Next week, we're going to take those 100 ideas and we're going to get down to this many, and it's going to be a lot of hard work, and we're going to have to put our analytical hats on, but that's not what today's role is, right? That's just so, one it, Like we have, for example, just like some people on, like on our team where they'll have ideas, right? Let's say we're, we're doing some social media for somebody, and then we'll have ideas. Is there, like, they'll just take the first good idea, and everybody's just like, yeah, let's just roll with that. There needs to be an ability to pile on and challenge, not necessarily say like, dude, your idea sucks, but how about this? How about this? Like that's the nurturing that I would love to see happen. There's, there's something called holding creative tension, right? Mm -hmm. There's a healthy creative tension that, that will exist around an idea with potential, right? And generally the, 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 the more senior people that have gotten, you know, more experience are able to better, you know, and quickly recognize ideas with potential. And hopefully they will seize those and, and hold that space. You got to hold an idea and allow that creative tension to work through the room so that everyone feels comfortable contributing to an idea. But what you're really speaking about is one of the, the great failings of, create, of agencies that want to be creative and agencies that are striving to be more creative, mm -hmm. which, is which is not recognizing that there's really two key parts of the process. There's all the fun of ideating. Right. There's all the fun of brainstorming and going off to top golf, you know, and having a drink at 6 p.m. as you're hitting golf balls going, yeah, what if we did this? Right. Well, the other half of the process is just as important and it's hard. It's judging. It's figuring out which ideas have got the most potential. It's about going from 100 ideas down to five which is a hard, which is a really tough thing to do. Once you get rolling with ideas, you can build a lot of ideas quick, but when you've got to make a decision to go from those last six ideas to the, to the three that the budget will accommodate you to pursue and prototype, there's a lot of love in that room for a lot of those ideas. And there's a lot of criticism around the weakest points of one idea versus another. So there are lots of exercises and processes that good um, experienced teams and agencies can go through to say, hey, not only are we good at cultivating and building ideas with lots of potential, but we know exactly when to stop building an idea because we got to move on to build another idea, right? And we can then take the seeds of those ideas and then put them through a process that compares them and brings the brief back into play or brings some, some, some KPIs around what our success metrics are gonna be and judge the potential of those ideas about how successful they might be against you know, whatever the measures of success for this project are gonna be. And those conversations help us say, okay, 
Yeah, we were really in love with idea six, but we really recognize that this fourth idea has got a ton more upside. So this one's going to, we're going to move on this one. So you're saying to create more, because the, the way I look at it is creativity. Um, we said this at the top of the show, uh, uh, Dave and I, when we were chatting is I, I believe it's sol- creativity is anything that solves a problem, right? For the most part. And, 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 and with that, I think the approach would be defining that problem. And then we try to attack it with ideas. Are you saying that it's a better just create an open space, you know, saying like, hey, this is this thing we want to, you know, uh, solve potentially, and then everybody throws ideas? Can you talk me through what that looks like? Yeah, you know, I, I, I would, I would, I would and challenge me on that. You could say like, no, dude, that's not creativity. I, I, yeah. Well, well, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to point out that not all creative people are problem solvers. Not all, not all, not all creativity is, is, is undertaken with the purpose of solving a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people define creativity, for example, Steve Jobs, creativity is just connecting things, right? Mm-hmm. He talked a lot about the dots that connect, you know, that famous mm-hmm. Stanford commencement speech that he gave. Yep. And he basically, the theory is that the more experience in life you have, the more raw material you have in your brain. And the more dots in your brain that exist via new experience, the greater your chances are of seeing a connection that no one's ever seen before. And some people define creativity is seeing what everyone else sees in the world, but noticing what someone has never noticed before. Mm-hmm. Right. And creativity is, is also the having the ability to express what it is that you're observing. Right. So, so, so to notice something that's never that two and two, that's never been put together to, before to equal five or seven mm-hmm. or whatever, mm-hmm. and then have a means of expressing that to the world, whether it's through a, a logo or through a, an oil painting or through, through a great creative brief, it doesn't really matter. Um, that's, that's the nature of what creativity really is, is seeing the world with fresh eyes mm-hmm. and making connections that are unusual, fresh, new connections, because through making those new fresh connections, we're able to build new fresh ideas. And then those ideas can be put in the service of the problems and the challenges that we're facing. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it it all really starts with a, to to answer, kind of get to your answer. It all starts with a a childlike sense of exploration and play Mm -hmm. that, 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 that has to be free of the, 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 the looming um, charge to solve a problem or, or free of judgment or free of whatever those measures of success are, are going to be eventually. But to start a creative process and to sort of like um, acculturate a, a creative um, um, vibe or a culture in your organization, your agency, you've got to be willing to allow that free form childlike exploration to happen, knowing full well that then you have to behave like an adult later and engage in a creative process that says, hey, how could this idea be stronger? Which of these two ideas is the one that's got the most potential? Let's analyze that for a second. Let's put ourselves in our client's shoes or our audience's shoes. And let's be creative around the ways that we can take the seed of this idea and grow it into an amazing tree that bears all kinds of fruit down the road, right? And so I think a lot of agencies that aspire to be creative, you know, um, and, and struggle with it, are struggling with how to work the whole process. Like, you know, for example, and, I'm, and I, I say this coming from my own design background, perhaps you've got a designer or a creative director who's highly creative, right? Um, but you might struggle to execute or you're really good at coming up with a hundred ideas, but you're really um, not that experienced or not that uh, successful yet about figuring out which two are gonna hit the bullseye, right? So there's an analytical process that comes with a, a an exploratory process that has to be two sides of the same coin, you know? And we call that um, uh, expansive thinking and reductive thinking, right? The, the sort of design thinking principles say that when we build ideas, we're doing one thing and we're acting like children because, right, children have no restraints. They have no limits. They, 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 they don't know wrong yet, and that's great. And yet, what we also have to do is act reductively to say, hey, we can't, we can't execute all these ideas. We have to find the best ones, right? So we have to act like children and then act like adults. And we have to vacillate and we have to pivot and periodically go back and forth. And that's how we strengthen ideas to, to become really smart, really sharp, um, so that they'll penetrate, right? So just kind of understanding that that's a, a really generalized way of describing what you've got to do to be creative in an agency context kind of helps make it a little bit more understandable about why so many agencies kind of struggle to actually pay it off. It's hard to execute on creativity. Yeah, because really- that sounds, yeah, and worked for a few uh, marketing companies. And I think it, it, we always approached it as like, okay, here's this problem that we want to solve. And 
and we always lay out the floor like no idea it's a bad idea and i've not talking i i heard some horrible ideas in that scenario i was like i can't believe that they brought that up the bad, um, I, the bad ideas are the best ideas there's actually a there's actually a tool that you can or a technique that you can use and i love this because it kind of shocks my clients and i, and I get a good response i say or the team i'll say tell me the idea that gets us fired what are the absolute worst ideas that you can possibly come up with that would never in a million years fly in this situation? And in fact, might cause a client to go get the hell out, right? Yeah. Because in a, in a private space where people feel comfortable, and here's the other thing, that, the other reason why agencies struggle to be creative, you've got to have enormously high levels of psychological comfort and protection and trust in your culture, your team's culture, mm -hmm. so that you and I feel comfortable sharing with the other 10 people in the room, the craziest shit we would ever come up with. Right. right. I, I don't want to feel like I'm going to be judged. And in fact, the reason why those brainstorms go 45 minutes before things get sparking is because everyone's going, well, I'm not going to say it. I don't, I don't know that I want to give, uh, you know, the, the guys over there in the, um, in the corner, he's the, he's the regional CEO. I've never met him before, but I'm not going to lose my job putting that, putting my harebrained idea out on the table, right? Well, good teams, they don't care about that. They just go, right? Because they know they can't get to the amazing ideas without churning through the 50 or 60 harebrained, crazy ideas that would get us fired, right? But to go back to what I was saying, it's not just about saying, well, I've got to give you my harebrained idea so I can get to a good idea. The harebrained ideas are actually a very fertile ground for reverse engineering, right? So, so in a, in, in a, in a crazy, you know, get us fired kind of concept, there might be a kernel of something that allows us to go, Hmm, can we build that? Can we, hold on, let's strip everything else away so that we don't get fired. But that little one thing, that one, one little element of that crazy idea is actually not so crazy. Right. And, and, and it's, 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 it's a ton of fun and it's highly productive to really challenge what you think is crap, but to actually make it work for you, you know? Um, it, it, it can start with, well, we just can't do that in our industry. Oh, really? Okay. Well, I'll bet you you can if you just gave yourself time to, to imagine it. So let's, there's nothing, there's no money on the line. There's, there's no client in the room. Let's just imagine a world where we could break that rule and let's make something good of it. And in telling ourselves that story, like visualizing, it's almost like a, a thought exercise in prototyping. You're not actually building a prototype. You're not going to code anything in the next 45 minutes, but we can lay out a scenario for ourselves of the way our client's business is working differently because we broke a rule. And then suddenly it's, it might not be that hard to imagine reverse engineering ourselves back to a portion of that in order to capture the benefit of it. Right. Again, not the whole idea, which might still be harebrained, but, a, but some portion of that idea has got some intrinsic value and let's, let's seize that and build it into what we're doing, you know? So what type of people do you, it's kind of a two part question, look to build your creative teams with, right? Cause I know there's been studies that show that the older that some people get, the less creative they become. So yeah. can you kind of talk about that? Yeah, sure. You know, I've worked with, I've worked with, I've worked by myself. I've worked in teams of just me and a partner. I've worked in teams where I've had, you know, five to, to 10 to 12, you know, people across different dis creative disciplines. And I've also worked in teams of over a hundred where there's media specialists and, you know, advertising people and copywriters and creatives and production folks and all that. So here's what I can tell you. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, if you are a creature of habit, as you get older, those habits are going to work against you in, in our industry, in the agency industry, because you know, you've got to maintain a fresh perspective on the world and the way the world is changing. Otherwise you're, you're being left behind. And so that's one of the reasons why people look and, and, and like pop culture fresh or I, th I think, I think pop culture, but I think societal trends and I think just the way that, that culture and society moves and is moving and has moved um, is something that you've got to really be willing to, to kind of keep up with. Right. Mm -hmm. Especially in advertising because advertising is such, it has such a close relationship to pop culture and, and culture in general. You know, if you don't, if you don't have your finger on what the zeitgeist is kind of like toying with at the moment, it can, it can be really hard to, 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 to be relevant. Have you ever seen somebody though that like appears to like live in that world or that zeitgeist, right? But then they can apply none of it to their work. <laughs> well, usually it's, it's someone who's lacking in, in another behavior that you can engage in to be more creative, which is bravery. 
right? The most creative people are often the most courageous uh, uh, among us, right? They, 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 they don't fear what the CEO is going to say because just because they're in the room, um, they know that if they don't engage in putting their ideas out on the table, it's like Michael Jordan, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. The ideas that stay in your mind will never, ever, ever help anyone. They won't help you look better. They won't help your client do anything better. They're not going to help your team or your agency do better. So you've got to put them out there. And that requires incredible bravery, right? Um, you know, the, 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 so you get someone that's perhaps a little bit older and right. And they're, they're ensconced in their career and they're secure and they don't want to get fired and they're not looking to, you know, so you kind of start to back off of your edge just a little bit. Right. When I teach graphic design, I, I tell my designers, it's very, and my design students, it's very important to go all the way to the edge, look over, get that queasy feeling in your stomach and then take a step back and where you stand a step back is safe, but exhilarating right? There's less danger. You're not going to fall. In- At our agency, we tell them to grow wings, Jim, when they get to that edge. There you go. <laughs> um, so, so whether you're growing wings to soar across it or stepping back so you don't fall over it, it's, it's living in the, in, the, in the periphery of that edge that kind of makes your, your hair stand on end and gets your, you and your team really excited when that idea hits and everyone goes, oh, okay, there it is. There's something there, right? So get uncomfortable to get uncomfortable. And what research actually revealed and showed is that the creative minds that are the most high performing creative minds actually have an enormous threshold for discomfort. Okay. So one of the things I've been telling people lately with all the, you know, the the way the world is changing is that one of the things you can do to benefit yourself right now, as you're trying to answer questions is gather the most creative people in your organization and listen to them not because I'm a designer and I want designers to, to have the ear of their leaders, but creative people, their whole livelihoods are predicated around the unknown, the unpredictable and sorting through it. Show me a creative director that wants to be told exactly to how, to, how to solve a problem, right? You, you can't find them. Creatives want the uncertainty of a situation because they want the joy and the exhilaration of the journey that gets them to fresh thinking and dots that have never been connected before, right? Because that's what they thrive on. So in a, at a time when the world is uncertain and companies' futures and their pathways through this jungle are, in, are uncertain, you know, your creative staff and your creative people, um, they've lived and thrived under uncertainty for a long time. Listen to what they have to say. They might actually have some really interesting perspective and they might be a lot more comfortable with this level of uncertainty than, you know, than your average person. All right. I dig that. So if you were to put together, like how big, how big is, so my questions are, how big is too big of a team, right? Because I I know a little bit about uh, Apple and essentially I knew there was a a hyper focus on the uh, number of people that would be in a room for something. If there was over like five or six, it was just, no, there's, there's too many people in here and we're we're not going to get anywhere. So what is like the perfect scenario for a, a creative session with, uh, you know, the number of people and potentially the, the length of time? What is it, the, the two pizza rule? Who is that? Is that Amazon? Who's got that? that two pizza I think that might be Amazon, yeah. Um, you know, I, I think it's a bit of a, um, it, it might be a little bit of a trick question. I don't think that there's a, a perfect answer in any sort of situation. Um, certainly what happens is you, um, well, let me finish by giving you the last little bit of the last answer because I think it dovetails. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to pause that for just a second. You back, <laughs> you back up to the older person who's, who's seen as less creative. Yeah. That, what that person is also doing is engaging in endowment bias, right? They value their own expertise more than they value um, outside expertise that might actually change their perspective, right? Because they value their expertise over other stuff, right? Right, yeah. Well, it's experience. Why, why wouldn't you trust what you've already right. known and seen? It's a, it's, it's a real thing and it's a real impediment to staying open-minded in a childlike sense of wonder and exploring the world, right? Mm -hmm. So let's, okay. So now let's fast forward back to this, this, this question in a small group, right? Like, like one of the, one of the go-to mindsets is, well, you need a creative idea. Let me get my creative team, you know, and I'm going to put four or five people in the room. We'll keep it really tight. We'll have all the best creative thinkers, right? There's a lot of endowment bias that's going to be in that room. There's a lot of um, blinders that are going to be on from the point of view of, you know, creative professionals that, that may not 
get us to all four corners of the challenge, right? Um, so I think the right size of a team to engage in creative thinking and creative work is always, it should always include a certain um, intellectual diversity and, 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 and diversity in general, so that you've got enough outside perspective to challenge a lot of whatever institutional or endowment biases might be at play with a smaller team, you know? Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and so it can be as damaging to have a, a too small a team as it can be to have too large of a team. If the project is massive, you can do multiple groups with multiple uh, populations. Don't always have the same group coming together to sort through ideas or to build ideas. You might actually, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're working on the enterprise level, you know, you might actually have three or four or five brainstorm ideation sessions with three or four or five different groups of people that aren't ever the same twice, you know? Mm -hmm. And that is simply to engage in enough diverse thinking to gather enough raw material so that later when you're engaged in that very adult process of judging and refining and reducing the ideas and then building those, those reduced number of ideas into really strong ideas, which is a whole other skill and art in and of itself, um, then you've kind of, you know, done your due diligence, right? But imagine something at the enterprise level where you've got the same five people meeting five times to really drill down deeply into what they think those five people think is the winning idea for a $13 million, you know, effort. There's a really high likelihood that they've not taken some very important information into account at somewhere along the way. And the longer you go, the more your risk is of running up against something that is a landmine that really sets you back or, or, or really breaks apart or, or torpedoes, you know, what, what you thought was a really good idea, you know? So diversity first, and you've got to kind of let your instinct guide you. Is it a team of eight? Is it a team of 10? Um, uh, a lot of times what um, I've seen agencies do, which is really productive is to, to gather a large group first for inclusivity and to sort through ideas and then let a, a, a an ever slowly dwindling group of, of um, a working group, parse through what that raw material is and what that raw material means to engage in the sort of like higher order strategic thinking of, of how we decide what it is we're going to move on. You know, I'm working with an agency, um, helping an agency right now um, that has got a hundred ideas for how they want to get through COVID-19. And um, I'm, I'm helping them understand that, you know, you don't want to do 10 of them. And they, well, what do you mean? I said, well, if you try to do 10 out of your 100 ideas, you're going to do 10 with about 10% of your effort and your bandwidth. You want, just like in a room of 100 people, you don't want 98 people nodding their heads going, man, that could work, right? I, I've, I've, let me change that. I've been in a room of 12 people where I wasn't looking to get consensus. You want the idea that has six or seven people going, hmm, that's interesting, but it's got two people not paying attention to you because they're busy texting their colleague going, oh, you're gonna, this is going to be amazing. I can't wait to, you want, you want to capture lightning in a bottle, but it doesn't have to be with everybody at once, right? So I said, you know, you don't want to do 10 ideas because you'll do them weekly. You want to find the two ideas that you can hit out of the park repeatedly to do your best work all the time and, and to get you through this in a, in a, in a different way. So sometimes agencies kind of let, let it, a working group naturally shrink until you've got a key uh, core of, of strategic thinkers that, are, that help it move into the executional phase. And then the whole agency comes back into, the, back into the fray and say, okay, now we're ready to start executing these ideas that you helped us come up with. And in that way, everyone feels like, A, I got to contribute. B, I didn't have to go to 68 different meetings to get to this point. And C, now I get to play a, a valuable role in, in, in kicking it off and building it and launching it and so forth and so on. So how are they, other than like 100 ideas, how, how are they using, you know, or would you recommend others use downtime right now for, for from a creative standpoint to overcome whatever is around the corner with, you know, COVID-19? Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm working on a piece right now and I'm really happy to have this opportunity to talk with you about it because it helps me sort of, you know, get the ideas out there and formulate them in my own mind as I, as I write and share about them. I, it came to me and I realized that there's really um, some th key things that a lot of agencies are, have traditionally struggled with um, before COVID-19 um, around creativity. You know, creativity and innovation are, are similar terms in that they're ubiquitous and everyone really wants to use them. And they're easy words to say. They're very, very difficult words to actually pay off and deliver, right? 
So, you know, when agencies kind of struggle about their, around their creative efforts and how to be more creative, it occurred to me that there's some real opportunities here. You know, we've all been given through this crisis a sudden unexpected wealth of the most valuable asset any human being can have, and that's time, right? Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, with this time, what can we be doing? I think there's four things that agencies could be doing right now so that when they come out of this thing, when the gates kind of open up and things start to relax and we try to get back to whatever the new normal is going to be, that agencies can be stronger and, and better prepared and have a better chance of, of moving forward confidently. Okay, I'll go through them quickly and then we can talk about details or if you wanna ask you know, questions. Um, the first is kind of something I mentioned earlier, this idea of freshness, you know? In a nine to five workaday world, we don't always get the chance. We, we are all creatures of habit and you're working a 60 hour a week, you're gonna take the same way home every day because it's the quickest way. And you're gonna turn on that TV program for 15 minutes to sort of like shut your brain off when you get home because it's the same program that you watch every day and you're gonna drink the same drink and you're gonna, you know what I mean? Read the same newspaper, the same magazine. So being creatures of habit only feels more comfortable to us, especially during a crisis. But the wealth of time that we have is super important because now we can actually spend it engaging in freshness. All social distancing aside, you can do stuff that you've never done before. Go to a different park, take a different route around town when you drive to your pharmacy to get your prescription or to your grocery store to get milk. You can read different materials. You can consume different things. You can engage with people, maybe online, you know, meeting someone new and learning something about them. It's a deliberate intent to put fresh raw material into your brain. And it's an investment and an insurance policy so that whether it's six hours from now or six months from now or six years from now, you're going to go, oh, hey, 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 you know what? I think maybe I've got two dots that I can connect in a way that no one's ever thought of connecting. Before. It's just getting outside of your comfort zone is what you're saying. And yeah, you there's, there's, a, there's a certain level of comfort that we're all seeking right now during a crisis. But you know, creativity is actually quite unnatural in, in a certain way in that it forces us to see and want to um, uh, uh, interpret and express the world differently, right? Mm. So, so the comfort that the human animal receives from our habits today is born out of tens of thousands of years of evolution of doing the same things the same way, mm -hmm. get a repeatable result and not die. You know, because, right. And I think there's like some exercises that some people do where it's the, uh, there's, I don't know, I think it was like on a TED talk, the guys think of random words that go in succession based on like when you're brushing your teeth, right? That's, that's a creative exercise you can do every day. There's yeah, yeah. No, another one, I think it's uh, James Altucher or whatever. It's like, uh, you write, write 10, 10 ideas every day. doesn't matter what it is. Just, you know, get those out. Absolutely. Um, is that kind of what you're thinking, you know, what you're getting at there is, you know, to try to draw the awareness to create, you know, fresh experiences, and then you can put those into some type of practice? Yeah, it's, 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 it's definitely a two step process, right? Okay, so in the middle of the process, you've got a challenge, I've got to solve a problem, I've got to address a challenge, I've got to, I've got to address a human centered need, hopefully, you know, for my client or for my organization, whatever it is, what exists prior to you addressing that challenge is all your life experience that you're going to draw on in your head to go, oh, how, how can we do this differently, right? Mm -hmm. And then what exists after that challenge is uh, what happens when you're able to take all that raw material and process it in a new way, right? Um, uh, so assuming you don't want to come up with a solution that someone else has already come up with and just ride on a coattail or copy someone, which is something that we can't do in our industry, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to have a wealth of experience, right? And this is where the paradox comes in, right? That 50 year old creative director who's getting old and people think that he's not creative as he used to be has actually got a wealth more of experience. If he maintains a creative mindset and an open mindedness to continually wandering through life in a curious state, He's going to remain creative regardless, right? Because he's got those dots to connect, right? And so when you're faced with a challenge, then the techniques that you talked about really become productive. If I have to write down 10 ideas, I got to think really hard about 10 new ways to view this problem. Mm -hmm. And viewing that problem in 10 different ways only comes from because, hey, you know what? I saw a kid kicking a shoe down the street the other day. And that makes me realize that this could actually, you know what I mean? Like it, it doesn't matter what it is that you've experienced new. It's all fodder for, for an interesting idea potentially. Yeah. And you got to be able to, you know, have the awareness uh, to, to get to it. That's right. That's right. So, so freshness, you know, putting new stuff in, 
in, in the kitchen pantry of your mind. Is Where's the overload though? You know what I mean? Where's like, there's like a saturation point, whether it's data or just, you know, what you're consuming, where it's, it's too much. Well, hopefully it, it's not does that data. exist? Hopefully it's not data. Hopefully it's life, right? I mean, <laughs> you, get high, you get high and oversaturated on life. It's not necessarily. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, you know, I mean, I think every person is different. You'll find as a general rule that highly creative people are highly curious people. Because somehow, whether they've expressed it that way or been taught that way or learned it somewhere along the way, or whether it's completely uh, subconscious to them, they know. They know that casting a wild net, a wide net, and learning as much as they can about as many different things and experiencing as much as they can only helps them solve problems and address challenges better down, down the road. Okay. All right. And would you, uh, do you see a link between, this is another two-part, I don't know, maybe that's how my mind works, coming in questions of two. But I know a lot of creatives are hard on meeting deadlines, right? There's a, it, that, that's, that's an issue. And then do you see a link between like overly creative people and depression? Hmm. And Knowing so, that you're not an MD or whatever, I mean, just, you know, based on your experiences. Well, I mean, I can only speak from my personal experience to the first part of that question, which is I never wanted to work an 80 hour week and give up my family time and give up my weekends, you know, just to, to grind and go for that, you know, golden pencil, you know. Um, so my approach has been the same pretty much my whole career, which is I, I don't believe in working hard. And that's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow, especially when I've got a client sitting across the table from me. And what, yeah. I, it, what, what I say is when I work smart, the hard work all takes care of itself. I, I believe in being really attenuated with the way I apply my creative thinking, my strategic thinking to your problems so that we're not spinning our wheels for an 80 hour week to come up with something that we've got to execute in the 82nd hour to meet the deadline because who wants to live that way? Right. I, I never did, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so I've kind of made that my mantra about like, I, I'm not going to work hard for you. I'm going to work really smart for you because when I work smart, I work fast. And when I work fast, you get more value. And as I get really smart across the course of my career, I'm speaking not necessarily for me, but for anyone, mm -hmm. that smartness translates into much higher levels of value than you can ever get from hard work because there's only so many hours in a day. Right. And, um, and so but how, you know, you know, when you reach the point though, of like, this is the best idea. Is it like a pencils down approach, but like 60 minutes, you know, we're, we're done. I think that's one of the, the hardest things. It never works the same way twice. And one thing, okay. So let's go back to my list though. So first of freshness, right? Yeah. I'll, I'll skip ahead. Uh, no, actually, it's actually my second thing. I've got my notes right here. <laughs> is the, the time that we now have allows us to do more fresh things, right? We, we can introduce more freshness into our life. The second thing is that we have the, the benefit of time to start cultivating a deeper sense of our own intuition, okay? The chance that we talked about this briefly earlier this week, you know, the, 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 the chances are that either you or your employees working remotely are going to be engaged in more decision-making individually than they might have in a, in a group dynamic, right? You've got someone sitting at home who knows that that email may not come in the next 10 minutes that they need. Mm -hmm. They also know that they need to give their coworker the benefit of, of human empathy to know that they're dealing with stuff in their life and that they may not be as responsive. And that's okay right now, right? Mm -hmm. Leaders are learning this as we speak, right? And you've also got, you know, people that are just saying, let me take the initiative to make a decision so that I can prove my value in this environment, right? So all of those, those dynamics are creating situations where our employees and us are making more decisions. We have to, we have to make the call. Okay. So that we can keep things moving and keep the gears um, turning to, to the best of our abilities that requires a sense of trust in ourselves and a sense of our intuitive uh, uh, conversations that we have with our own intuition in order to trust the decisions that we're going to go ahead and make. Right. So people who have a deep and abiding trust in their own intuition, know when to put the pencil down. Right. And when I, again, when I teach design, I say, as a designer, the choices are out there like leaves on, a, on an oak tree. You've got an enormous trunk, which is the problem. And you've got branches, which are like strategic directions you could take to solve a problem. And then you've got smaller branches. And then eventually you've got the leaves, which are the individual aspects and details of the ideas that could be executed to pay off, you know, those, those strategies. Well, no one's got the time to touch all the idea, to touch all the leaves. Mm -hmm. You can only choose so many. Eventually, as a creative, 
you've got to cultivate a sense of where do I want to go? Which branches am I going to climb out on? Which ideas do I think have the best chance intuitively to pay off the most so that I can make some smart, again, smart choices so that I can go down three or four or five or six of these branches and understand a better sense of where my best potential lies, right? And if you put 10 other designers in that tree, they're going to go to a million different other places that I never went, right? So it's never possible to get it all sorted out. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's really the difference between, you know, agency A and agency B, where, you know, you just may as a client feel more attuned to how they climb the tree, right? And, and what branches they go to. I love the ideas that they come up with because they, they, they kind of, you know, approach the tree climbing process this way, right? I tend to speak in metaphor a lot. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so when you cultivate a deep sense of your own intuition, so that you can make some of these calls on your own working remotely. That intuition comes back to you tenfold when you return to your team and suddenly you have a collective sense of what ideas that you can really march on well and what the team can really hit into the stratosphere and, and, and launch into orbit uh, versus the things that you might have toyed with and wasted a lot of time on, right? It's never impossible to get out of those situations. Every agency and every team is always going to have a, a toe stubbing moment where they spend a week pushing something that just uh, just never quite gets anywhere. But you you're know, saying momentum, right? Yeah. Well, that's another one that I'm getting to, right? Oh. You know, so, so the the sense of intuition that you need to know when to put down the pencil is is kind of the answer to your question. But it comes at different stages of the game. You know, it comes at uh, comes at different moments, and it comes often from different people on the team that might bring something to the table and say, "I just want to stop you right there. You seem to be kind of tentative about it. I'm going to tell you why that's a million dollar idea." And by the time five minutes goes by, everyone in the room is like, "Okay, well, I think we've got it. Let's go." Right? So <clears throat> it's all about intuition. And in the hustle and bustle of an 80, 60 hour work week, you know, when everyone's like piling on all the time, it's hard. And when you've got like, hey, can you put your eyeballs on this? And hey, let's, let's hold a focus group real quick and let's have a brainstorm to sort out, you know, these things. You've got constant protection from, up, from the group think, right? Mm -hmm. That doesn't exist now. And so intuition is becoming a really, really important soft skill. But if you, as a leader, as an agency founder or owner, if you're encouraging people to take initiative and get in touch with their intuition and make those calls, you will emerge as an agency and as a team um, with a broader, bigger, deeper sense of how to tap into that and trust, right? Trust what you want to pursue as something that you can make work. You know, that's really, really valuable. And usually the teams, like you, you've mentioned several times, the people that are struggling, right? Mm -hmm. Say they want it. Maybe they're even calling themselves creative, but they're not really that creative. They're just a, a, a normal, like I'll, I'll call it a normal, you know, digital agency that, that doesn't really break off creative in the traditional sense. I thought you were saying like a normal is like, you're a creative and you're a normal. <laughs> I mean, like there's, a, there's a digital agency model, right? No, no, no. I get what you're saying. Yeah. I thought you were talking about individually as people. And I was just thinking of these two little buckets. You know, Carl's in the normal I'm, bucket. I'm he crossed to the creative side. <laughs> I'm thinking of your audience in specific, right? Yeah, yeah, no, I totally get it. Yeah. The world. Right. When, when the struggle with creativity happens, it's usually a struggle with trust. Mm -hmm. And you're usually not quite as trustful as you hoped you could be around what your intuition is telling you. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I kind of feel this, but I'm not so sure. Right. Yeah. Again, grow the wings, right. Or at mm -hmm. least be comfortable standing there and, and pondering, you know, how to right. make this thing work. Right. So you mentioned momentum, right. And, and before momentum comes like a, a, a kind of an extension of freshness, which is curiosity. Right. Right. And I just, I don't mean curiosity in the sense of be curious about the world so that you can engage in freshness, right? That's not just it, right? Mm -hmm. But curiosity and, the, and combined with this wealth of time that we have actually gives agencies a chance to do something that's highly valuable and something that most of us fumble most of the time, which is like everything that sits on the shelves behind us, right? Oh, we're going to get to our brand someday. And when we're not quite so busy with all this client work, then we're going to rebuild our website. And yeah, I know we need to get our sales funnel re, re, refigured out because it's not working the way that it worked five years ago. We'll get to it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and curiosity isn't just about the world around us, but curiosity also needs to exist in this time around what we're doing, the work that we're engaged in, right? 
and owners and principals and founders have very little time. They wish they had more to back away from the business and really say, is our mission as valid as it was when we founded ourselves five years ago? What's our place in the market right now? Do we need to think about pivoting, right? And then you layer everything with COVID on top of that. And it's a, it's a, it's a, a world of existential questions that we need to be curious about. Mm -hmm. And we might not ever have the same kind of wealth of time to invest in our own brands and our own selves um, to be ponderous and curious about what we need to be thinking of um, as we as we can right now, right? So, so that deep curiosity about the work that we're engaged in kind of combines with a freshness and curiosity uh, of the world around us so that when, again, when this, when we do start to come out of this uh, as a leader and as a strategist, you might have uh, had the opportunity to, to build a, a deeper, more trustworthy sense of where you need to go as an agency and what you need to do to come out of this thing um, in the best possible way. Okay. And that, and that kind of leads me to the fourth bit, which is momentum, like you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And this is the most paradoxical one of all, because all of us right now feel the world slowing down, right? Every day. I don't know if it's the same for you guys. Every day to me seems like 36 hours long. Really? It's just ponderously slow. It's like it, we're, uh, everything you're distracted by the news and, and all this stuff's going on. But as we feel the world kind of winding down and slowing down around us, it may feel like there's no momentum to be had, right? We all want to regain the momentum that we had last fall when things were kicking and everyone was like cracking their knuckles for 2020 going, this is going to be the year, right? The year of focus, the year of 2020. Focus. I, did a, I did a podcast with another guy in Gainesville named Colin Austin. He said, our, our word of the year was frictionless and it lasted about 15 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. We had to figure out what was going to be next. Yeah, month and, and a half. And so the paradox here is that, again, the wealth of time allows us to, in a new environment, right, with free of distractions, okay? Now, I want to separate, like, my cat that's over there and my, my, my three boys that are elsewhere in the house. Yes, you can be distracted by the things around you. But I'm not being distracted by waiting for an email or being called into a last second meeting in the conference room that's going to last 90 minutes and get me nowhere that takes me out of where my head has been for the last two hours when I was really in the zone, right? To engage in flow thinking, which is a highly creative state where time dilates. And have you ever been in that place where you get a day's worth of work done before 10 a.m.? Yeah. Because you didn't get distracted and you really blew through something and you're like, every wow. day. You read it every day. <laughs> the, the, that state of flow is, is what we all want. And when you're not being distracted, even if it's because there's less work to be done, the work that you are engaged in right now can have a lot more momentum build behind it because you're able to hunker down and focus on it because you won't be pulled in 14 different directions before lunchtime. And because you're able for once, right? How many times have you all sat down and said, if I could only work on this for a half a day, I could get it done. Mm -hmm. But I only get to work on it in 10 minute increments, mm -hmm. right? And I only get to do that three times a week. So of course it's taken 16 weeks to get this thing, you know, with any, you know, wind uh, in the sail, so to speak. Well, that's the momentum I'm talking about. And whether it's momentum with a, a project that you're pulling off the shelf to, to address for your own internal needs, right? That's mm. gone long ignored. And, and, and I say that's the biggest lie we tell ourselves as agency people is that that's imp that internal thing is important. We're going to come back to that when we're, when we're just less busy. Mm. It never happens. Um, but you can build momentum by getting into those states of flow because you don't have the normal distractions, right? So if you're engaged in some freshness and you're starting to cultivate some intuition and some trust in your own intuition, and you really hunker down and get curious about the nature of what you're doing and the work that you're engaged in, you can take the projects that you can work on right now and build unbelievable momentum behind them. You can move them forward, you know, leaps and bounds over what you could have possibly done before so that, and in the many cases of like internal projects that would help your agency or your company or whatever, when you start to, when we start to emerge from this thing, you're in a really good place, right? Your agency might be more creative. Your agency might be more intuitive. Um, your ability to, 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 to move and act on things decisively because of you trusting your, your own intuition or your group intuition uh, is strengthened. And suddenly the things that you might have always struggled with going far in the past uh, before uh, COVID-19 
are now suddenly assets and things that you're doing better, you know, moving forward with whatever client work that you're working on or whatever challenges that you're dealing with or whatever things you're, 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 you're tasked with. I think it's okay. you know, my general approach to things is this glass half full and opportunistic, you know? So, so I really do believe in taking these challenges that we're facing and sorting out what the opportunities are within those challenges. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I like that four-step process and we're, we're almost, we're almost coming out of time. So I want to give you an opportunity uh, to answer a couple more questions. Sure. The, so right now, if an agency wanted to be more creative, do they just go through that four-step process or what can they do to take the next step? So they're essentially producing better and more abundant ideas. Yeah. Better, better and more abundant ideas, right? It's it, like I said earlier, it's all about habitual um, engagement and habits and behaviors that really allow those uh, creative cultures to flourish within agencies. You've got to be trustworthy of each other and protective of each other. You know, you, you, we, we debate and we criticize the work. We never criticize the person so that no one ever feels uncomfortable putting something out on the table. Um, we recognize that the work that comes from the group is always going to be stronger than the work that might come from a single individual because it's informed Mm -hmm. by a broader and more diverse set of perspectives. And so, you know, ultimately, you know, what I bring to the table isn't nearly as important as what we all facilitate together, right? Mm -hmm. There's an amazing trust there. If we're all engaged in fresh thinking and constantly seeking out freshness to inform not just our lives, but maybe a project, right? Um, you, know, you can seek freshness around the aspects and details of a, of a client's industry or, or, or their, their world or, or their need. Um, things like I mentioned before, like signaling, taking the time to make sure that everyone knows exactly what um, is needed from them at any given moment or within any given meeting. When you call a brainstorm and say, today's an idea only brainstorm, we're not judging anything or no wrong answers. Um, you get a lot more productivity. You get a lot more traction. You get a lot more raw material and you're cultivating much, much more ideas that are, that are likely going to uncover the good ideas, right? The easy ideas are the first ideas. We all mm -hmm. know that. the hard ideas, the ones that take a long time to get to are the ones that usually are the biggest, right? Um, I think it was uh, David Cronenberg, the filmmaker that said, if you want to catch the big fish, you have to go into the deep waters and it's kind of dangerous, but the fish are beautiful hmm. and they're enormous, right? Um, so you've got to be willing to, to, to engage in that. Um, you know, bravery. Uh, that I mentioned before is, is a key habit, right? So I've got, a, I've got, a, when I run workshops and do these things, I usually go through a, a series of six or eight, you know, really clear habits that you can engage in, not relatable to client work all the time mm -hmm. uh, and more relatable to how you live your life. And you can live a more interesting life by being more curious, more brave, you know, and, and more fresh with your experiences and, and, and a host of other things. Um, you can be a better communicator by signaling better, right? So there's some real sort of like good, good, solid principles. Okay. Uh, but I think that any agency that wants to be more creative has got to understand that coming up with the ideas is, is only half of the battle. And the other half is figuring out which are the good ones. And right. I, actually love a lot, I love a lot of the techniques that allow you to compare creative ideas that, that, that inject a little bit of objectivity into a very subjective world of you know, like, what if, you know, we did this thing. So. All right. Right on. No, yeah. I like that answer. Um, all right. So this is your space to, Promote or pedal anything that you would like, Jim. Oh, oh, okay. I didn't know. I didn't know that was coming. I thought we were doing yeah. that. I thought we were doing that on the front end. Um, <laughs> I, I've, you know, I've spent almost thirty years doing this now. And like I said, you know, my the any creative kind of gets to the point where the work that they created as an individual kind of gives way to the satisfaction they derive from working with others and collaborating with others, and and in my case with the University of Florida, teaching others and mentoring others, right? Um, and so I've really kind of taken that to heart and, and, and wanted to mold Metavisual, um, which I founded in 2007, into something now that allows me to coach, mentor, help, work with agencies and clients. You know, I work with marketing directors and CEOs and founders and entrepreneurs and also agencies that do this work for, for other clients in order to simply unlock what that creative potential is. And so whether I'm actually facilitating the actual ideation process or teaching an agency um, how, to, how to do the same for the people that they serve and the constituents and clients that they have. Um, that's what really turns me on. That's what I really enjoy doing. 
All right, cool. Right on. Um, I guess a couple more final questions and the, uh, I'm, I'm going to be running over time, uh, real quick. Uh, one, uh, do you have any tools that you recommend, uh, you know, creatives use? Oh, wow. Um, and you could send me a list later and I can just put them in the show notes. But yeah. Well, that's something I would I like to all, I think a lot of creatives use the same tools for the most part, you know, cause the creative suite and all the software and stuff. I think books and print. What still- books? Books. That was my second question. So yeah, what books do you recommend? I mean, I've got like right now I'm looking at a, a stack of books that I'm reading. I just finished Alchemy by Rory Sutherland, which is a really specifically uh, genius level book. He's a, he's a creative chair for Ogilvy over at the UK. And he, he wrote a book called Alchemy about ideas that don't make sense, like human behavior that goes against the grain of, of what we expect to happen. Like what, what economists tell us will happen. When but you live in Florida. So do I. So I think that's kind of uh, you know, we've yeah, seen right. some of Florida man doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah. I'm reading a couple of books by a guy named Dave Trot, which, which are full of really great anecdotes. One's called creative blindness. Um, and I've got a host of others, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Marty Newmeyer and the brand gap, you know, and uh, um, the designful company. And he's written a couple more. He's actually got a, a new uh, book out called meta skills, which is, which is really uh, fascinating. It's about the, the core uh, skills for creativity and innovation moving forward in the years ahead and how um, with the rise of AI and, and artificial intelligence and things like that, these meta skills are gonna become uh, the skills that are most in demand. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that in the last five, three to five years, creativity has rocketed up the ladder of the most in demand soft uh, 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 skills by leaders and CEOs worldwide, you know, critical thinking, creative thinking, right. Are now near or at the top of the list, depending on who's doing the study and who's, and who's doing the asking. Right. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, these meta skills that Marty Newmeyer talks about are highly, highly important. Um, well, I've got okay. a I, can, I can certainly send you that, that list. Yeah. Send me a list. I'd love to add a list to the show notes and, and, uh, and uh, paper is always a tool. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Just, yeah. Just, uh, just trudging it out. But Jim, I really appreciate uh, you being on, man. Thank you so much. Oh, it was my pleasure. It was a real uh, joy to talk about these things with you. And I'm happy to answer any questions that any of your uh, viewers might have as follow-ups later. All right. Perfect. Take care, All right. man. All right. Take Thanks. care, guys. Good right. talking Bye to now. you. Likewise. So Dave, how do you think that went? Well, I mean, I think in general, you've, you, you know, this is, this is why I hire creative people because, um, you know, I just had to zone out. Like there, there's not much there for me, you know, like, especially when he said, uh, he doesn't work hard. I'm thinking the operation person to me just kicked into high gear and said, what happens when the world isn't ideal and we're on the 11th hour and the client has got a server down. I want somebody working hard for me because the, the time of smart working is over. You have to think the whole gambit of like you know the scenario like i i would just think if somebody sat across the table and told me that i'd be like oh okay because i, I think from his perspective though he's not in any of those situations that you mentioned it's always ever, ever. I, I don't know about that but i mean on on the on the front end side of it i i think it's more uh you're in a safe space sure yep and yeah. i mean just from an operations and and you know person from my background like I try to be creative. I love being creative, but I, I, there's got to be a business goal behind it. Like, you know, we're not going to spend five days thinking about ideas. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you have to be creative within limits. This is business. And I think that's the balance, right? Because there's this wonderful utopia of where you get to create all these ideas and there's some amazing things that can happen from those. I think um, you and myself, we're more on the constraints side of it. It's, we have a day to get all of these ideas together. You guys got a ton of stuff that you're already working on. So you actually have 20 minutes. What do you got? All right. Right. And I, maybe that's too tight a constraints. That's where I was really digging in to try to understand how agencies could build this more team approach with, because sure. if you think about it, you're charging, you know, 150, some agencies are charging $200 an hour. You have six people in that meeting right? So at that point, that's $1,200 an hour that's being charged to the client for a creative meeting. Yeah. That's a lot of money. I mean, 
that's why I try to pad everything even over and above what a creative tells me just because I, because we are from the structure perspective, we have to assume what happens if shit goes wrong. You know, mm -hmm. creatives don't think that way. They don't, it's always from a place of the utopia of, oh no, everything's going to go great. The ideas are just going to flow to me. They're going to be perfect. So. But I think it's also creating a balanced team, which he was also uh, speaking to, right? So you need to have, yeah, some, and then there's somebody else that's on the other. I, I don't even, I, didn't, I dare say even conservative because I don't think it is conservative. I think it's more uh, practical, right? Skeptical, I think is the word I'm looking for. Somebody that's very, you know, challenging of those ideas. And maybe that's not the right space to do it in. And maybe that's more on that, that working group side. But, so this reminds me of like the first development team I worked on. Um, we were really well constructed because we had like that one genius character and we had like a couple, you know, multiple types and, and it was a really good team. But if we had two genius characters on the team, it would have, it would have been just nonstop fighting. You know, they, they just, you can't have two of those type of developers. The egos would have just crushed each other. Correct. Yeah. And then same with creatives. You can't have two creative directors. And then it reminds me of, um, it's that what's that old uh i'm not even gonna get into it do it's it too old of a reference it's like no do it eight bit nintendo reference do we want to go there let's go there let's do it all this right. is the end of the show you talked about easter eggs like two episodes ago might as well all right like the first hockey game ever made for the nintendo i, I want to say it was called um blades of steel okay i can see the cover like the person was sliding out yeah actually yeah, yeah. no i think it was just called ice hockey and you had to pick between like the skinny dude how creative the medium build dude and the fat dude. And you had to pick your five players. And if you went all fat dudes and your team was slow, yeah, they could, they could beat you up on the boards, but you weren't catching anyone. If you went all skinny dudes, yeah, you were fast, but you had no beef. So you had to create a balanced team. And I, I'm a big, big proponent of crafting, creating your team. It has to be balanced. Mm -hmm. There has to be pros and cons of each member. They have to play off each other and kind of know their role. And tolerate each other. Exactly. Yeah, there's certain people that just cannot stand the existence of another human and they don't make good team members. And I've been trying, I've been, tr I've tried to hold people together on that type of team and it's exhausting. It just uh, depletes you of energy and they spend too much time just trying to, to combat each other. But I, I've had some luck where I've been on some, some amazing teams where they were able to foster ideas at, um, at a fast pace. I don't like, I don't like long meetings. You know, if uh, sometimes I'll, I'll get booked in like a two hour meeting and I'm instantly just thinking like, Oh God, you know, how can I get out of this? This, this, this sucks. So that's where I was, you know, how quick can we develop certain things, you know, but also have enough, you know, uh, space to create a zone of fresh thinking, if you will. Cause I think that's sure. something that we could walk away with here. How can we encourage our team members to produce better ideas, whether that's, on a creative campaign or just structuring, you know, uh, the, the company, I, I think it's, it's, it's an everything and everywhere. But I also believe when we define that problem, what we're going to, to work on, to me, that means we're working towards something other than, other than that, I think it's potentially we're in this space of play and maybe that's just not the, the game I like to play. Well, and I think you only get that latitude when you have already proven yourself to a client, like, no client's going to be like, hey, guys, just, you know, everybody just get in a room and spend 10 hours all thinking about ideas for us. I mean, nobody's paying for that. But our clients that have been long term that we've, you know, proven success and we kind of kick ass and I've and they've asked, they've brought a problem to me and they're like, hey, we need you to figure this out. And it's complex. I mean, it's not something I can just be like, hey, what about this? I've said, hey, can you give me 15 hours approved to just think about it? And they're like, yeah. And I'll bring people together in the conference room and we'll talk about it. Well, map it out on the whiteboard and we talk about the pros and cons and like the realities of the issue and and they you know it affords us that time to go through why it won't work why will this work the scenarios of when it will work and when it mm. won't work and and that's fun i mean that's what i love doing and that's one advantage of like living in corporate world is you have nothing but time so if you do have to solve a problem in the corporate world you do have all the time in the world to think about the problem Reminds me when you hear about these consultants that were for, uh, like, what, what are some of the, uh, there's like Salesforce. What is the other one that is bigger ERP? I'm thinking That's of. Sweet. SAP. 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 Every time I've ever talked to anybody about their SAP rollout, they're like, 
Oh yeah, we're about two years over uh, over deadline. <laughs> Dude, I just quoted, so no shit. One of our new clients is about to do a NetSuite rollout. Yeah, and um, they've already started the initial phase, but because of Corona, NetSuite, you know, it's good for them. They said, "Hey, look, we're not going to charge you your setup fee yet. You have six more months before we continue." So they're like, "Hey, should we go forward with this?" And I'm like, "All right, here's the deal. You're going to do the setup, and then two years later." And so basically, if they went forward with the setup, they would be moving away from us. And I said, all right, I think you should, if that's what you want to do, go for it. And we'll still be work. you'll still be a customer of ours for life because uh, your NetSuite guy will never get finished with what you needed to do. And you'll constantly be looking at, you know, paying for someone and you'll never get any. I was like, I've seen it with, with um, Salesforce. I've seen it with, I mean, all these online database and cloud systems it's expensive and nobody really has a true vision of what they want it to do. They think it's a magic pill. Yeah. And as soon as you get it to that point of vision, it's like, Oh wait, but it didn't do that one thing we needed it to do earlier. It's like, well, let's go ahead and just revert back. Right. Yeah. yeah that's what is, that's what's uh, sold to some, uh, some capacity it's built to do everything generically. But if you have anything unique, you have, you have to hire a coder to do that or somebody that's smart, you know, that can put that shit together. And people don't realize that. And the salespeople of these cloud database, you know, these cloud systems don't say that. And, and those are very unique, you know, niche developers. So they're very expensive. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, you saved, uh, saved an account. Yeah. I mean, they agreed. So, I mean, I was able to paint that picture. I've got a lot of experience in that. And uh, what's the Microsoft product? It's the same thing. Uh, SharePoint. SharePoint. Yeah. Does any, I mean, Six months ago, we've got a client that wants an intranet portal that want, they want integrated with SharePoint. And, and I, I literally had to, in the meeting, say, you do know SharePoint is an intra, intranet product. I remember this. Yeah, and they, they understood it, but nobody knew how to use it, so they didn't know how to use it right. So they wanted us to build something that integrated with it so they can access the files that are in SharePoint, but without actually using SharePoint. I was like mind blown you're paying that much money to microsoft for glorified network storage we had a client speaking of creative problems so we had a client that said my it director is about to sign a deal for sharepoint and it's going to cost us three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars to build what we want and that we think it's going to take you know six months so six months means you know two oh, years or whatnot right and he said is, do you have another solution that you could do? We're like, yeah, all right, cool. So uh, we essentially went to work on it. And we were more on the marketing agency side of things, but we'll help out a client in any way, any form. Sure. So we, uh, we, we, we take that on and we found a solution, literally need for need, exactly what they wanted to do. I, I can find out whatever the software was that did exactly what they wanted. It was 11,000 bucks, $11,000. And it was literally ready to go in like a month out of the box. They just customized some things, bolt on. They still dude, want to point. Oh, dude, that IT director, he still hates me. I, I, I bet, you know, when it comes down to the coronavirus right now, he's probably staring at a picture of me on his wall, you know, as a scope on it to, to some extent. Just so pissed that virus is at you. Because every, yeah, everything that he said, because we're in the meeting, we were presenting everything that he threw out. We're like, oh, yeah, we got it right here. Click. We'd go to the next slide. Like, oh, yeah, we're going to do this. Oh, yeah, yeah, click. Yeah, we do that. Oh, yeah, it also integrates with, with Microsoft. Yeah, so what does it matter? I learned early in my career, I hate dealing with the IT manager, the IT director. Give me the marketing person all day, every day. Like the IT person, they want, how do they save money? How their idea is better? How your idea sucks and is a security risk? I mean, it's the same fucking playbook. Like you want to talk about the marketing playbook? The protectionist IT manager playbook is so tired. It's so old. It comes from the 70s. It's so annoying. It's, I mean... I could, when I walk in there and I see that, I'm just like, all right, James, let's do it. I mean, yeah, that fits this guy to a T. And his assistant's name was James. It's funny you mentioned that. A Jim or James, you're going to get one of those. Yeah. And actually, uh, that guy, I, I love that guy. He was, he was really cool. He, uh, he moved on to another company, the, the underling. Yeah. All right. Is there anything else we want to? I know there was a lot learned, a lot said on this episode. Is there anything else we want to say other than the sh we, uh, we just secured our hotel for the, the DMG? Uh, you know what? I'm going to do a plug at the beginning of the show, too. I need uh, to start doing that every show. The plug I know. I know, man. Just, yeah. Just, it's my, it's my day job. That's part, of, yeah, that's part of the introduction. Like, hey, here's a little thing about our guest. 
Let me talk about the event. Instead, you put me on the spot every beginning of the episode, though. I do. I do. I literally, it's, you know what, in, in improv, that, I can't remember what they call that, but you're never supposed to do that. It's, Welcome to the show. Dave, what do you think? <laughs> we'll change it. We'll change it from moving forward. I'm going to have this long dialogue. I think in the, some of the first ones I did that, there was this long dialogue. But Ooh, back that, to the plug. Maybe needs, I think we should do like a five minute intro, talk about the topic. Boom. Hey, let me remind you, DMG, September, blah, blah, blah. And then pull it back and then, uh, yeah, that will be good to go. Yeah, I, I like cool. that idea. Yeah. Another solid episode. Um, good work. Likewise. Thank you so much. You're a hell of a contributor on this one. Yeah. I mean, I, I was trying, but um, I didn't see my didn't see opportunities. My yeah. All right, my friend. Other than that, we'll go ahead and close this up and uh, I'll see you again real soon. All righty.